Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with John Gressman, President and CEO of the San Francisco Community Clinic Consortium. John has led the Clinic Consortium since 1991, where he has championed access to health care in a climate of legislative changes to Medicaid, HMOs, and clinics. In 1996, Gressman received the Primary Care Achievement Award from the Pew Charitable Trust for Excellence in Advancing Primary Care Practice. The San Francisco Community Clinic Consortium was created in 1982 to allow its partner clinics to pool their collective resources in order to ensure that people at greatest risk of poor health did not continue to fall through the cracks of the health care system. The clinics provide primary care to over 77,000 San Franciscans annually through four main programs, access to care, workforce development, maximization of limited resources, and health policy. John has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, John, for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I appreciate it. 77,000. That is an incredible number. It's 10% of the San Francisco population. 10% of the San Francisco population that are receiving care that they would not otherwise receive. Or if they receive care, it would be going to the local emergency room and encumbering a bill that would be upwards of four, six, eight thousand dollars $8,000. So we really are the alternative to emergency room care. So if the consortium did not exist, if yes. these facilities did not exist, the people don't go away. The people don't go away. We would see higher death rates among newborns. We'd see seniors not getting medications, ignoring their health, showing up sicker. We'd see people entering emergency rooms with complications of diabetes, where their diabetes would be out of control. We have a program that we've been working with Kaiser Permanente, taking the Kaiser program and bringing it in, called FAZE, Preventing Heart Attacks and Strokes Every Day. We see a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks. So our healthcare costs would escalate even greater today than it, without the health centers. So let's talk about the health centers. Let's talk about your 10 partners and, and how you're organized uh, to, to serve these 77,000. Our largest health center is Northeast Medical Services, located on the border of Chinatown, uh, North Beach. Um, they see about 55,000 patients. Our smallest health center is Curry Senior Services in the Tenderloin, which is a program targeting seniors who live in the Tenderloin. They all come together, they identify joint projects, and then we move forward. Some examples, um, as I said, we have this Kaiser program. Kaiser has, Permanente has been a phenomenal partner about sharing their protocols with us to try to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So we bring them together, we provide technical assistance on site with the clinics, we work with them, we work on system changes. We also go out and we contract with or receive funds in from private foundations in the federal government. We receive about $7 million a year from federal government funding called the Healthcare for the Homeless Program. It's a federal program. It's part of a $2.5 billion package for the country. And we contract with the federal government, we contract out for the clinics to provide services for people who are experiencing being homeless. We do all the centralized data reporting. We do all the centralized reporting to the government. So therefore, we're not replicating costs in 10 different agencies, including the health department, 10 different administrative costs. So you have all that cost centralized into one entity, and that can then that money go back into patient care. So you function as a shared services center for these yes. 10 clinics. We have another program funded by the Meta Foundation. Meta Foundation is the conversion foundation um, from when Davies Hospital converted um, under a California Pacific Medical Center. Uh, Meta has been absolutely a stellar along with Blue Shield Foundation, Blue Shield of California, to fund us to provide technical assistance and guiding in helping to navigate through healthcare reform through the Affordable Care Act. We're seeing the evolution of a new model called patient-centered health homes. And it's what we all want. We want to get our care in one place. We want it coordinated. We want it based on evidence-based decision-making. This is, and this is the whole, one of the core principles of healthcare reform. So we're working with our clinics to enhance their current systems by collective uh, sharing of experiences, by joint development of proto clinical protocols, by bringing in experts who can help them in system changes, improving their electronic health record systems, their reporting system, and helping the staff to understand and utilize this information better. 
Another critical component that we have is healthcare policy. We're, we're dealing with a population that are busy, most, a lot of our people are at poverty level or about 200% of poverty level. So a person of about $21,000 an individual would be one of our target, a, po a family of four living under, with $34,000 in San Francisco. They're not gonna worry about what's going on in Washington or Sacramento or even City Hall. They're busy about trying to live. So we can bring their collective voice through our health centers and represent it to Congress, to the White House, to the state legislature, to the governor, to the board of supervisors, to the mayor, all of which are really extremely receptive. We were in healthcare reform. We were able to represent the interest of, the, of this population, not only for San Francisco, but across the country that in healthcare reform, health centers, and there's 1,400 across the country, will go from seeing 20 million patients to 40 million patients across the country, uninsured people, people like you or me who are so dependent on employment-based insurance that when I get laid off, when my kid can't get a job, when it gets out of college, my, my whatever situation is, that, that there's a safety net of health care there for them that will see them and welcome them. So in many respects, is, is this a type of privatized uh, safety net? It's, it's not a government-provided uh, safety net. It is in part government-funded. It has a large component of government funding. It has a large part of Medi-Cal or outside of California, Medicaid revenue, Medicare revenue, healthy families revenue. So yes, it is. It's a government-funded, um, but it's run by community governing boards. For the health centers, 51% of our governing board members come from being patients in the health center. So it's a really a tie from the patient all the way through up to including the governance. How do you know that the uh, various uh, clinics are being run uh, effectively, efficiently, and to what extent does the consortium help or facilitate that, that sort of effective administration so that money is being not only cost effectively used, but as much money as possible is being invested into the care mm -hmm. and not into the administration? Um, for the clinics that we fund directly, which are most of the clinics in San Francisco, San Francisco Free Clinic, St. Anthony Free Clinic are totally privately funded through philanthropic foundations. St. Anthony Foundation has been around since the early 1950s, well known for the St. Anthony Dining Room. San Francisco Free started about mm, 17 years ago, large private family support, large private foundation support taking those two out, all the other eight clinics we have. We receive their audits. We look at their audits, their annual audits. We look and see how they're spending their money. We evaluate their annual reports they submit to the state to look and see how much money they're spending in administration, how much is going to clinical care, how much is going to education of patients, um, how much is going to fundraising to make sure that that's an appropriate amount. We look at their governing board structure to make sure they have an adequate number of governing board members. Um, we then also, on the clinical side, because we work so closely with the San Francisco Health Department and Blue Cross of California, there are a set of clinical indicators that have to do with childhood immunization, mammography screening for breast cancer, uh, diabetes indicators, hemoglobin A1C, glucose levels, hypertension, blood pressure. We work with those health plans, all of which contract. We work together and we look at those clinical indicators to make sure. Um, six months ago, we went public on our website that where we actually compare our clinics collectively on certain indicators in diabetes and hypertension against other clinics across California, but also against other HMO, we're not an HMO, but other comparable groups. Not to make anyone look bad, but to say, this is how we compare. So we've got clinical, we've got governance, and we've got financial systems that we're looking at. So you're creating transparency and a, and a basis for comparison. You're basically exposing yourself to criticism. Absolutely. And your clinics to criticism. Absolutely. So that you can self-correct. And then the other component, and we're in the process of rolling this on a more structured kind of way. The federal government, so the Department of Health and Human Services, has an evaluation tool. It's a checklist and the checklist is either met or unmet. 
and it spells out certain criteria. And we have used segments of that, but we're gonna do it more organ in a more formalized kind of system where it goes from every element of governance to administration, to financing, to clinical care, to contract compliance, to billing systems, you name it, this, it's covered in this document. It's an established published document. We have an evaluation team of three that will be going out, one that will be handling governance and administration, one handling finance, and one handling clinical. It will be an evaluation that will be conducted and then a corrective action plan worked up with the individual clinic themselves. The clinics welcome it. They feel like it really helps them to do it. And what we recommend and they generally do is they do it first. Internally in our own agency to make sure as a CEO to make sure we're maximizing all the resources we get, whether it's a private donor who sends us, we have a donor who sends us $3 every month and have been doing it for 15 years to other donors who are doing much larger donations to the foundations, to the federal government, to the, to the commitments we make in our partnerships. We're using the same instrument internally to evaluate to make sure we have effective systems in everything that we do. In essence, is the funding that you receive, regardless, uh, well, uh, from the various government ent entities in particular, is, is that a fee for service as opposed to a grant? Very often, government funding is described as a grant, which, which gives a, a sense of somebody just sort of writing you carte blanche and you just sort of absorb the money and, and that's it. Right. Um, it comes through to us, all these things come through to us as a grant. How are there concrete deliverables that we must meet? So on our Healthcare for the Homeless program, as an example, we commit to the federal government, we will see 16,000 patients for, for a given number of patient visits. At the end of each year, we have a, a report that we have to submit. And if we don't come within 90% of what we commit to, which we always do. We always are generally the 100 to 105 percent, and we monitor that internally constantly. If we don't come in with that 90 percent, we have to have a justification that comes that's approved by my board of directors to the federal government. By the same token, with Blue Shield Foundation, when they recently funded us for a grant to move us into this patient-centered medical home, there are a set of concrete deliverables that we commit to them and we monitor them internally quarterly to make sure that we're at least on a reasonable course understanding that at any time something could happen but that we're coming within our promised deliverables. That's one of the things that's made the consortium have a national reputation that we do deliver what we say we're going to deliver or if we don't we go back and renegotiate so that whoever our partner is in funding, federal government, private individuals, if a person gives us, an unrest gives us a restricted grant that we go back and talk with that individual or partner about what we're doing and the changes we need and explain it. In terms of your relationship with, with your funders, do you find it to be satisfactory, onerous, too much regulation, not enough oversight? How is that perceived? Let by? me break those into two categories, if I may. On the federal government side, um, and we are not get, we're, not, we're not receiving any state funds at this point on the city government, so we have two sources of funding. Um, they have a high accountability to the public and we know that our report becomes part of a much larger report. But I also know that whether it be Congresswoman Speer, Congresswoman Pelosi, Senator Feinstein, Senator Fox, Boxer, all have called and said, tell me your numbers because I'm gonna use them in a speech or some type of statement I'm gonna make before the congressional record. So we wanna make sure they're accurate. Are they onerous? It, it is what it is. It's, we have, we're spending American public funding. So trying to be really accountable is, I think, acceptable. I don't particularly find it's overwhelming. Um, we're in a high level of accountability in this day and age, and so I think we're trying to maximize every dollar. To Americans as your shareholders. Absolutely. I mean, people say it's the government. Well, I go out and I represent and I talk about what we're doing and every, I'm aware of every time I speak to a group that, that that's a person who's paying our salaries, paying for the care, and they want the best we can offer. On the private side, it's the same thing. It's not government funding, but those funds are coming from someplace. And so for the private foundations like Blue Shield Foundation, McKesson, uh, the, the um, more local foundations like the Haas Foundation, 
all of those people are giving money in good faith. And so it's our responsibility. On the private foundation side, their reports are less cumbersome. They're much more give me highlights and than a lot of the detail. And they're, but again, we're welcome to give them whatever they want. Your intention is to um, expand, sustain. Uh, your population, certainly, the need is, is growing. Our board of directors has recently approved that we'll be expanding and opening to new memberships and new clinics. Um, just to try to bring more people to the table. So we have one of the key issues though is people, agencies that we bring to the table will have as their core focus, primary care services for people who are someplace between poverty level up to about 300% of poverty level. This doesn't mean that private practices aren't important. It means it's not our target population. Right. And so we're trying to stay within our target population. There's an outstanding clinic that just moved from near St. Mary's over to Western Edition on um, Fillmore Street Women's Community Clinic that will be extended an invitation to come in. And we've been working with Women's Community Clinic since the day they got started. Um, there are some other really good clinics that we'll be talking with about extending an invitation for membership. However, when we extend an invitation for membership, we also carefully credential our members to make sure that they meet the quality indicators in all the areas we're talking about, governance, administration, finance, clinical services, or that they meet certain criteria so that we have a caliber. So when the consortium has a member, it's as one of the health commissioners of San Francisco said, we're the good house can keep you seal of approval. So that's what we want to maintain. Not that we're exclusive, but we want to make sure that we're bringing in the best and, and that people can be proud of their care. What does the uh, consortium look like organizationally? Quite, quite separate from the various clinics, right? Uh, but, but just the organization itself. We have a 10-member board of directors starting with the governance. Um, the members are elected by representatives of each of the clinics. Um, generally, it's historically a clinic leader because it's, we're so involved in daily information sharing. Um, we have the president CEO, my position. We then have five what I call leadership team or senior managers. We have a vice president of programs um, who has been with us 23 years. We have a vice president of finance and operations and information technology who's been with us 11 years. We have a vice president of policy who's just celebrated 10 years with us, who had worked in the health department prior to coming with us. We have a vice president of development and communications who has been with us also 10 years. That was the executive director of West... Westside? Westside Mental Health, thank you. Oh, okay, yes. United Way of Silicon Valley and under Mayor Frank Jordan was a homeless coordinator. And then we have a medical director who is our youngest in terms of longevity, who's been with us close to four years now, who's a physician who who is with us four days a week and then practices at St. Anthony Clinic another day a week. That's the five. We then go down to the next step and we have uh, program managers. They're responsible for the daily activities uh, that go on. We have a mobile medical van that goes out of our office for uh, homeless people. So it's a van that goes to 20 locations a week. They drive up, people can come in. We have doctors on the van, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants. And when that van, we try to hook the person into an ongoing primary care home. We have a director that, and with the outreach staff there. We have a director of quality assurance um, who works in helping the clinics develop and move in systems. We have accounting finance staff. Um, we have data staff. So it, and then we have the reception staff. We also have a cadre of volunteers. And the volunteers are really important from serving on the van to coming in and helping us out. Um, on different kinds of projects um, that we do. Then most recently, we have um, two AmeriCorps members that work for us. Uh, we have two VISTA members, and then we have launched in partnership with California Healthcare Foundation, the NCORE program. NCORE started in the education system. NCORE are people who are nearing the retirement age from, from corporate America who want to continue to do something on they receive a $25,000 stipend, and they take on a certain project or projects. They work in the nonprofit for 20 hours a week, and so we have an encore. So we have a retiring uh, Hewlett Packard person who's going to advance us even more on trying to bring clinics together on finding ways to 
reduce their costs, and put that money into patient care. What you're basically talking about is the administrative infrastructure of those 10 clinics shrinks considerably. Mm -hmm and then is used co in a complementary way amongst the, the, the clinics. So this can't be seen as a separate organization. It really is part of the overall uh, service delivery infrastructure. One of the things I say is we are our clinics, our clinics are us. We, are, we do different projects, but it's a continuity of trying to really build a seamless system. What do you see as some of the challenges going forward with the uh, budgetary constraints that we are all going to be living under over the next years? government funding is going to be very, very difficult uh, to acquire. And we're, we're tracking that. We're doing almost daily calls, including what happened in the White House conference today with the leadership from Congress. Um, let's start off with the national level. So on the national level, um, there has been conversations of totally eliminating the Community Health Center program, just doing it as part of the discretionary funding. Right. We do not believe that will happen because we, again, nationally we see 23 million patients. So nationally, if you do away with this program, what are you going to do with 23 million people who don't have no access to care? Could happen? We'll see. There may be some reductions. I think there will be more stringent regulations and more stringent oversight. However, more importantly for community health centers, we are extremely dependent on Medicaid, or in California, Medi-Cal funding. In the early 1990s, we restructured our Medi-Cal reimbursement system nationally. We moved from a straight, we're still a fee-for-service system, so we get paid for each visit. Um, however, we moved from what was traditional Medicaid, Medi-Cal rates, which would be 30 to $35 to an all-inclusive rate called prospective payment system. And so instead of a clinic getting a $20, $30 visit, it now includes in the formula that we submit to state and federal approval, each clinic does and they get their own rates, other kinds of services like uh, transportation services, enabling services, other kinds of services that support the care. And there's a factor in for those people who are uninsured who may contribute to their care but actually don't have enough money because they're living on a lower end of the income scale, that there is a formula where there's some sharing of costs to help us to get services out to the patients. The changes that are going to occur nationally on um, Medi-Cal are, are something we're really watching. Another challenge that we're looking for is the baby boomers are in the third year of hitting the Medicare system. So how is this influx of seniors that are baby boomers with more chronic diseases, living longer, going to impact the Medicare payment system and the Medicare structuring system. In healthcare reform, we're seeing the rollout of all kinds of new expectations. A seamless healthcare system was what every patient deserves. We've talked about it, but now it's being demanded of us. So how do we bring and create those systems with reducing revenues to support that? So this is going to be a matter of navigating through some very, yeah. very troubled waters, and it will be navigating through those troubled waters on a sustained basis. I've been working in primary care since 1980 when I ran a clinic for 11 years. This is the most turbulent time that I've seen in our career. I believe we can make it. I think health centers are tremendously resilient. They're strategic in their approach, and they're committed. John Gressman, thank you very much for spending your time with us. Thank you for your insights, and thank you for making this contribution to the health of San Franciscans. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.